As a special feature following the newsreel, the National Spiritual Assembly offers this tribute to Dr. Helen Elsie Austin, Knight of Baha'u'llah, Auxiliary Board Member, and a member of National Spiritual Assemblies on two continents. Lawyer, administrator, diplomat, feminist, and above all, dedicated Baha'i. Elsie Austin uniquely combined the traits of intelligence, tactfulness, sagacity, a natural unaffected dignity, and a sincere loving interest in the doings of her fellow humans with fierce independence, scrappy determination, and a sterling moral character. Such in brief was the remarkable life we celebrate with the passing of Helen Elsie Austin. No doubt her reward in the divine kingdom will be great, for manifestly great was her devotion to its Lord. The Baha'i writings express high hopes for children who are educated according to the teachings of Baha'u'llah. That you may each become a lighted candle in the world of humanity, may be devoted to the service of all mankind, may give up your rest and comfort, so that ye may become the cause of the tranquility of the world of creation. We definitely function better as a family. <laughs> After, you know, reading the writings, I remember hearing or reading somewhere that, you know, even if um, you read a little bit a day, you know, it changes your soul slowly, you know. And if you're, even if you're not aware of it, you're slowly changing. And I think that's the effect it had on our family. Within our family, it it's great. It's brought our family closer together. We communicate. The family was like a big, strong, a strong wind just gathered us up and held us in its arm and connected us as a family. According to the writings of the Baha'i Faith, family is where the seeds of world peace are born, nurtured, and grow. It's like a tree growing from a small little plant up. That's an organic process. It has nowhere else to go. It is the process of the Creator. Charlotte Kahn and John Fogarth live in the shadows of the four sacred mountains of the Navajo people in Arizona. It is here that they are raising their three children, Des, Nani, and James, in accordance with Navajo tradition and the spiritual values found in the writings of the Baha'i Faith. We are so uh, grounded and uh, have a spiritual, have a, had a spiritual upbringing. Um, I remember playing here in this area, in fact, playing on this very log that I'm sitting on as a child. But I remember most about this area is um, praying, getting up every morning and saying my prayers and being raised in this one room cabin here and coming back to this cabin over and over again all throughout my life and playing in this little stream here of the water in the water here knowing that it comes from flows directly from the earth and that its source is right here behind us at a couple of hundred feet and that's why this area is called Black Rock Spring because the water comes out from the earth right here and it's a sacred place my clans in Navajo are Tohiglini Nishlin, Tochitni Bashishin, Bitatni Dashiche, and Bilagana Dashinela. And that's my family that I just said in Navajo. 
my mom's side of the family and my father's side of the family. Charlotte is a third generation Baha'i and has raised her children to understand traditional Navajo values. Living on the Navajo Nation Reservation nurtures a love and respect for the natural environment and its people. It also brings a life of social and economic uncertainty that can often weigh down its residents. Until just a few years ago, the family had few of the conveniences that most people see as necessities, like running water and electricity. Yet, when the children were young, Charlotte and John found ways to keep the family happy and together. So, a long time ago, we bought a bunch of board games, you know? And then so we had kerosene lanterns and stuff like that, so we just kind of play in the candlelight type of thing, you know? But then it was all the games that brought us together in the first place, you know? All the family games we'd all play and like who's win, or like beat this guy, you know? Like most parents, as the children grew older, Charlotte became concerned about their future. She wanted them to be able to face the challenges an ever-changing world presents. And despite its foundation of unity, the family began to lose hold of its tight bond. Because of the world we live in today, that is changing every day so fast. And I was really struck by the awareness of all of this when my children were small. And um, looking at their innocent little eyes and wondering what they're learning and remembering what I was learning here, playing here by the water in the spring grass. So that's why I really became stronger in the faith, um, because I wanted to teach my children this way. Charlotte had concluded that she would get her whole family involved with the Baha'i community. She believed that by focusing on the study of the Baha'i writings, a unity could be formed that would forge a path of service for each of them. They began an intense study process, and each member of the family took steps to advance their spiritual development. Yeah, it was sort of that same feeling when we were doing board games, like, together type of thing, you know what I mean? So we kind of, we started out straight, but then we kind of lost track somewhere in the middle and then got back together again. In the summer of 2002, Des and Nani joined native Baha'is from Alaska, Canada, and the United States for a six-week intensive training institute in South Dakota. The group made it through all six books in the Rui sequence and practiced what they learned through service to the community. It was that six weeks that was the best six weeks I've ever experienced. And it was so intense and we did, we were such, you know, an inspired group that we went out into the community and we, we had just fun, you know, events and Baha'i gatherings and we went out and taught the faith. It did have a, a had a major impact in my life because that's when I realized, okay, this is who I am and I've got to be a serious youth if I want um, to be a role model for my friends. And all of those youth went on to do something like great. While the girls were away, Charlotte was asked to become the outreach coordinator at the Native American Baha'i Institute near the family's home in Arizona. This was no small task, given that her area of service included hundreds of miles of territory. Her role was to establish ongoing programs throughout the region, including children's classes, study groups, and devotional meetings. Everywhere she went, Charlotte brought members of her family to help organize the programs and act as tutors for the study groups. Continued study of the Baha'i faith and opportunities for service gave Charlotte an even deeper appreciation for the way Baha'i teachings could complement the native traditions she valued. And I realized that um, the teachings of the faith are very important. And then even more than that, that they go hand in hand with our great spiritual teachings of our people. This is wow, their lifestyle and the writings and everything is basically identical almost with the Navajo culture. And even my uh, great great grandmother told me that there is going to be a man who come out who bring in a new message of God. I felt this strong need for prayers. I don't know, something I woke up real early and something kind of like a magnet draw me to build a fire in the sweat lodge and I sat in there and prayed for about three hours. Through prayer and personal reflection, 
John decided to build a traditional Navajo prayer hogan that could be used as a meeting place for people from all over the world. A prayer house of worship, basically, you know, where you could say prayers and invite the Baha'is who are going to be growing in this community. This was before there wasn't too many Baha'is. John's example of service inspired his children and helped lay a new foundation of a unified family and turned the household into a point of attraction for the whole community. All through my life, my father's been excellent with, he just teaches, teaches me some real life, you know, things, things that you'll need throughout your life. So I would go up to, with him to chop trees down, to cut up the firewood, and I'm, I'm awesome with an ax. <laughs> And it's just, it comes with the territory, you know? It's part of the way, way of life. And it's all very spiritual when you think about it, because Baha'u'llah says work is worship, right? And when you do, when you're working, it's, it's, it's a prayer. And I think that's the gift my father has given me. He taught me how to be a hard worker. And so now I feel, I feel equipped to go out into the world. Seeing so many people from diverse backgrounds visit their family Hogan, Des, Nani, and James acquired a newfound sense of service and a vision of themselves as citizens of the world, not just the reservation. to Belize, I noticed, you know, how similar and alike our people are with the Belizeans there. And it was kind of the, you know, the opposite, you know, you think you're going to get a glimpse of the entire world, except I went there and I go, oh, they're just like us, you know. <laughs> Des and Nani traveled to Belize in Central America to participate in a youth project. Des was asked by the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Belize to be one of the project coordinators. People there were, you know, just like the Native Americans, um, you know, colonized by the British people, and the Native Americans kind of pushed around by the Europeans, and and so we got along really well. <laughs> and they were surprised to find out that I was from the United States, and that you know I was a Native American living on a reservation, quite similar to you know the Belizean way of living. And because their idea of an American is wealthy, you know, every family member, family member has a car, pretty much, well-to-do, college, and they thought I was a, just a, a rich girl, you know, coming down to help the poor Belizeans type of thing. I said, no, <laughs> I worked really hard to get here. Today we went to uh, some mine ruins and we went with a, our Baha'i friend who's mine herself and she showed us around and we climbed tall. <laughs> we climbed a lot of stairs let's say and we went to the top and we said some prayers and took some pictures. And it was amazing to me in my heart I could see things and feel a, you know, presence of spiritualness of, of ancient people there, and it was amazing. I myself felt like crying, but because uh, before I left, my grandparents were like, "Well, be sure and um, um, tell your friends that you, the Belizean people you meet there, that you're all related somehow." My grandfather had written a letter saying that 
the Belizeans, the Mayan here, were related to them. And he said, make sure that your relatives know that you're a Baha'i. Yes. And Good. it was really special. During the last newsreel, we learned how the Knoxville area cluster has developed through its commitment to a large number of people completing the sequence of courses. With a wider pool of trained individuals, the Knoxville area Baha'is have been able to increase the number of activities in their cluster, which has expanded their capacity to foster community life. This time, we will look at the San Gabriel Valley Cluster in California. Like the communities around Knoxville, San Gabriel Valley is an A cluster and has been invigorated by the Training Institute process. The San Gabriel Valley Cluster has created a welcoming and supportive community life that continues to attract people to the Baha'i faith. We have 17 communities in our cluster. Uh, 13 uh, with Baha'is, uh, six assemblies, um, almost 800,000 people in our cluster. We're over 100 square miles, so we're pretty big. The institute process serves as the engine, which generates resources and feeds them directly into the cluster. When people are in study circles, they're exposed to the Word of God, and they, they learn and internalize the Baha'i principles, which is inevitably going to make them better human resources. It's, it's going to, A, give them the drive to serve, and B, it's going to give them tools. In addition to the three core activities, historically successful teaching initiatives like Firesides continue to contribute to the growth of the cluster. James and Dorothy Nelson have been holding a fireside for more than 40 years in their home in Pasadena, and it continues to provide a chance for seekers to gain an introductory understanding of the Baha'i teachings and history. We'll explain the principles at first, and then uh, they rave about the speaker. They always bronze them on words, and then they have um, wonderful refreshments, and it's the fellowship. And it's not just one type of person that goes there. And we've been encouraging each other, supporting each other, and showing up to each other's events. This spirit of encouragement has released the initiative and leadership of the youth in the cluster. That's been the most powerful tool, you know, is having you really utilizing our youth and their energy and spirit. And they're not afraid to fail. You know, they're, they're excited about trying new things, and that's been a real, they've been awesome. When we put it all together on a cluster level, we've got this wonderful group of youth who are just completely on fire, completely taking the lead, and all of us old folks are just sitting back saying, oh, this is great. Youth has been, um, has set an example for me as a new Baha'i, they are always taking um, action. They're taking initiative, doing firesides, volunteering, hosting, um, you know, cluster meetings. Among the many initiatives sustaining the energy and growth of this cluster are reflection meetings. These meetings have been key to fostering a learning mode in which community members share successes, raise questions, and set attainable goals. By participating in the cluster, you then grow and expand that, that core of human resources. So for instance, um, the other communities within our cluster know that we have children's uh, teachers. So they will often ask us to come and either train, do trainings, or they will ask us to do the firesides when they have firesides. So you, 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 you expand the scope of human resources beyond your just single community. 
Everybody doesn't come through the same initial door. There's some people who come through a Ruhi class, and that's their first introduction to it because they have a friend who says, come over here. There's some people who come through proclamation to enter and through it. We looked at the core activities, devotional meetings, children's classes, and study circles as being of the utmost importance in our community. But what we did was also recognize this notion that this was not for Baha'is, that this really was for seekers. And then we just kind of said, let's just do it. If the House of Justice says our classes are open, let's really open them <laughs> and invite the seekers. And I think we were amazed because they liked it. You know, you walk into the well, into Baha'i school, and you can see that the oneness is there. Why Everybody's is in, you know, their families, their their oh, friends. Okay. You know, everybody Why comes, and it's always made, made me feel um, like I'm part of the Baha'i family. I have been a Baha'i for approximately six months. I needed support as a new Baha'i, and I got that. I was in not only firesides from all over this cluster. The community pulled together, they got the New Believers courses going for us, we have the Baha'i School. I was able to jump in because the community provided the support for me, and that established a connection for me. All this stuff allowed me to get into it and feel good about it, and because you still feel kind of unsure when it's new. And so that has really given me a really good foundation. Attempts to get people involved sort of didn't, didn't really happen for whatever reason. Most of the time, if you wanted something done, the assembly just sort of threw up its hands and said, okay, we're going to do it ourselves. So I think everyone um, really gets the feeling that the culture has changed. I guess I felt the fire in my soul just telling me, you know, it's time to not sit on your butt anymore and just, you can't just read in your room and tell people you're Baha'i. It's about the action. In April 2003, the Universal House of Justice drew the attention of the Baha'i world to three letters of Shoghi Effendi published in the World Order of Baha'u'llah. Baha'is in every country were asked to study the goal of a new world order, America and the most great peace, and the unfoldment of world civilization. The Universal House of Justice stated that these three letters would help Baha'is to recall the vision and principles offered by their faith to understand more deeply the teachings that are relevant to the spirit of unrest pervading the planet, and respond more effectively to anxieties and concerns expressed by their friends, neighbors, and co-workers. Later that year, youth and young adults in the Midwest found that these letters directly applied to their ongoing dialogue on globalization. The Globalization Forum was sponsored by the Regional Youth Committee of the Central States and spanned two weekends. It offered students the chance to look at the issues of the day through the prism of the Baha'i teachings. A lot of people's majors correlate very strongly with um, globalization, and it's being talked about heavily on the campus. So to be able to form an opinion on globalization and relate it to the Baha'i faith is very key to Baha'is, I think, now. I think that the students are really wanting to link the two because they're, they're understanding that globalization is a, is a process that they're being faced with all the time, daily, and as youth, they have a special role to become the leaders of the world. They want to have an answer when people say, what are the Baha'is doing about globalization? During the first weekend, students gained an understanding of the complexity of the issue. Presentations were made by youth and young adults who are studying social, economic, and cultural aspects of globalization in their university programs. The second globalization forum offered participants a thorough study of some of Shoghi Effendi's letters. Discussion was facilitated by Lacey Graves of the National Youth Desk and Peter Adrian's liaison to non-governmental organizations for the National Spiritual Assembly. Globalization is the topic of a heated international debate. Well, you find everything from enthusiastic support for the process to complete rejection of it. Much of the globalization debate has to do with economics. On one side of the issue are decision makers who are building international financial institutions 
and believe they are making it possible for everyone to fit into one world economic system. Those on the opposite side believe these new institutions actually create more poverty. A lot more jobs have been generated in some places, but on the other hand, jobs have been lost in other places, so there's quite a bit of displacement. Critics say only a tiny portion of the world's population is reaping the benefits of globalization. Globalization tends to have a lot of positive and negative aspects discussed in it, especially with students. I, th I probably at first hearing it just being a Baha'i thought, globalization, yay, good, like, you know, because anything that's world embracing, you know, I like the idea of, but I think this conference is about, like, well, what are the effects of that? Like, what's been happening now that we are coming together? I think that it might be important for Baha'i youth and Baha'is, just Baha'i adults, Baha'is in general, to really have a firm understanding of what globalization is and what the issues facing our society today are, because one of our main goals is the unity, is the unification of the world. And so anything that either hinders or helps that, um, we should know a lot about. Through the letters published in the World Order of Baha'u'llah, forum participants were reminded that the goal of the Baha'i faith is the emergence of one unified global society. In the World Order letters, Shoghi Fendi talks about these processes that the world will go through, and I think it's pretty comforting for a lot of students to know that this is, that this is expected, that this is something that, that's going to happen to their world. And it's important to lend that to their peers, too. Shoghi Effendi's letters also outline the guiding principles of creating a global society, one that ensures justice, health, security, and peace for all of humankind. Chief among these is the principle of the oneness of humanity, the cornerstone of Baha'u'llah's message. Shoghi Effendi wrote that the principle of the oneness of humanity goes beyond a reawakening of the spirit of brotherhood and concerns itself primarily with the nature of those essential relationships that bind all the states and nations as members of one human family. The most important things that Baha'is have to offer, one of the most important things is the concept of oneness. And it's really much more than just like the enunciation of an ideal. It's so deep and so organic and embedded in who we are. It's the pivot around which all the Baha'i teachings revolve. It has to be the pivot which globalization revolves around. And with that as the ethical basis, uh, everything else is possible. Without that, nothing is possible. Participants were galvanized to continue studying Shoghi Effendi's writings and to promote the principle of the oneness of humanity on their campuses and in their service opportunities. It often helps in our external affairs work, um, something to point to in our community where we're actually doing something that relates to the principles that we are promoting. Uh, having had the opportunity to spend uh, this weekend with, with these youth, I, I'm just really moved by their spirit, their enthusiasm, their depth of knowledge, um, and their, their vision. And I, I'm going to go back to Washington with a, a sense of reassurance that there is a youth community within the Baha'i community that can play a very active role in helping us to um, tell the story and um, help to provide solutions. In 2005, the letters published in the World Order of Baha'u'llah continue to be one of the central themes of study at national and regional Baha'i schools. The letters, study questions, and workshop guides are available online for personal study, community deepenings, and summer schools. Please visit www.education.usbnc.org.
every human being born into this world begins a lifetime adventure of becoming and overcoming the challenges of human experience. We are led to faith, a spiritual experience which both guides and empowers us to choose the values which promote through action and reaction the development of human beings and human society. The need to meet and overcome experiences of injustice, oppression, animosity is part of the human environment. And perspective in understanding what goes on in life has helped me to meet the challenges of human experience more successfully and has counteracted the feelings of revenge and the susceptibility to hatred which comes so naturally. The courage and commitment to reject that which is false and unjust involves a transforming spiritual power. And it is in this sense, every human being is potentially the light of the world or its darkness. Dr. Helen Elsie Austin was an extraordinary woman whose place is secure in both the history of America and of the Baha'i faith. She worked tirelessly to break down the barriers to racial and gender equality at a time when Americans of African descent, not to mention women, were virtually invisible in most circles of society. Her life is a distinguished record of American firsts. The period in which my childhood and adolescence occurred was a climate quite different from what you know today. That was a time when there were no laws to protect the individual or a community of minority status. For an African American, there was a daily encounter with rejection, danger, and persecution based on prejudice and hostility. African American survival in this period was based on using the defenses they had developed during the period of slavery. They learned to pool their strength in their segregated schools and churches and other improvement organizations where they were able to develop and promote the spirit of self-help and to devise educational measures which stimulated a sense of self-worth and dignity and action to persevere in overcoming obstacles and to achieve excellence. Elsie was born in Tuskegee, Alabama in 1908. Her parents, George and Mary Austin, were teachers at the Tuskegee Institute and were dedicated to education as a tool for economic survival and civil rights. Perhaps their most profound teaching was done in the Austin home. Elsie's values were shaped largely by the family's long tradition of oral history the passing down from generation to generation, family stories of struggle and achievement. At pivotal moments in her life, Elsie drew inspiration and strength from the story of her maternal great-grandmother, Louisa Dotson. Though Louisa and her husband, Mentor Dotson, were both born into slavery, Mentor eventually ran for election and won a seat in the Alabama State House of Representatives. Mentor's election made him a target for the Ku Klux Klan. And there were few nights 
when he could get to his home and be with his family. As the story goes, one night, when my great-grandmother, Louisa, was alone with just her children, the clan came to her house, broke in the door. Pointing guns at her, they demanded that she tell them where her husband was. She looked them in the eye. She said, just go ahead and kill me because I will never tell you where he is. After more curses and threats and shots, they decided not to kill her and left. I was awed and inspired by that story, by her courage, a lone woman in a hostile, dangerous environment and her determination not to give in to injustice and oppression, even at the risk of death. And I have in certain incidents of my life been reminded and relied upon the memory of her courage and her strength. Historians refer to the period between 1900 to 1920 as the Great Migration. Within two short decades, more than 500,000 African Americans left the South for jobs and opportunity in northern cities. Eight-year-old Elsie was a part of that history. As her parents moved the family north to ensure their children had the best possible education, they settled in Cincinnati, Ohio, where Elsie was sent to an all-black elementary school. After grade school, Elsie entered Walnut Hill, a predominantly white high school. On her very first day of class, the teacher shared from a history book the contributions to civilization made by each of humanity's racial groups. The book plainly stated that not only had the black race made no significant contribution to civilization, but in fact, had been created to play a subservient role to the more fortunate races. Can you imagine two little black girls in a school full of white children, in a classroom full of white children, and with all the candor and cruelty of the young, the entire class looked at us. And there were, of course, a few snickers and grins. It was then that I remembered my grandmother. I felt as if the Klan was standing there with the guns trained on me. With great resentment and resolve, I stood up and said, I was taught in a black school that Africans worked iron before Europeans knew anything about it. I was taught that they knew how to cast bronze in making statues and that they worked in gold and in ivory so beautifully that the European nations came to their shores to buy their carvings and statues. That's what I was taught in a black school. There was an electrical silence. But friends, can you imagine, if there had been no protest, what ingrained prejudice and hostility would have been implanted in the minds of those children. And what humiliation and degradation would have been stamped upon us. In 1928, Elsie entered the University of Cincinnati as a member of the first integrated undergraduate class. When she arrived on campus, Elsie and seven other African-American women students were brought into the administrator's office. In that session, they were told not to be conspicuous, reminded that they belonged to a subject race, and advised to have low expectations for their academic success. We were young sensitive, full of hope and aspiration for university education, 
that speech traumatized us. We sat down and discussed the situation. And then all eight of us decided that we were going out for everything in the university. We almost took an oath in blood that we were all to finish that first year with honors in something. By the end of the year, each one of us did take an honor. And at the beginning of the next year, that same official who had called us in and insulted us apologized for her remarks. Not only did Elsie finish her undergraduate degree with honors, she became the first black woman to graduate from the College of Law at the University of Cincinnati and the first black woman to serve as Assistant Attorney General for the state of Ohio. While in school, Elsie pledged Delta Sigma Theta. The sorority is composed of professional women who are college graduates and is today one of the largest African-American women's service sororities in the world. Its mission is to provide assistance and support to black women, promote academic excellence, economic development, and political awareness. Elsie Austin served as the sorority's eighth national president from 1939 to 1944. During her tenure, Elsie was the driving force behind the Delta's Jobs Project, a national program aimed at providing black women with mentorship and professional opportunities. In Search of Sisterhood chronicles the history of the Delta sorority and refers to the Jobs Project as the first major undertaking that focused specifically on black women, elevating the Deltas to a new level of service. I remember at this point how I became a Baha'i. For Elsie, the mid-1930s was a time of spiritual introspection. I was young, angry, incensed, and hostile. I went to my father and I said, I'm going to become an agnostic or an atheist because I just don't believe anymore in these religions that are all separate, all fighting with each other, all enforcing prejudice against some group. And yet they say God is the father of all mankind. My father heard me out and then said, well, before you do it, why don't you go and talk to these Cincinnati people who are talking about the Baha'i faith? He was not a Baha'i, but he said they have some very interesting views and maybe that will interest you. So I went and talked to the Baha'is. I took their literature around for two years to find things to argue about. And my confirming experiences were the activities and the attitudes of so many wonderful Baha'is who helped me overcome my bitterness. There was Mr. Lewis Grayberry, who taught classes about the faith with culture, with gentility and forcefulness that impressed everybody. There was Dorothy Baker in Lima, an atmosphere which was like a setting for the Ku Klux Klan, so rigid and so mean. But Dorothy Baker opened her home for Baha'i firesides to which came black and white inquirers from surrounding areas who listened and became attracted to the teachings. Elsie found that the teachings of the Baha'i faith were consistent with her deep desire to contribute to the well-being of humanity. Dr. Austin shared her thoughts on this subject in an article stating, the religion of Baha'u'llah, founder of the Baha'i faith, begins with that essential spiritual regeneration of the human being which creates a heart for brotherhood and impels action for the unity of mankind. Elsie became a member of the Baha'i Faith in 1934 and just 12 years later was elected to the nine-member national governing body. In 1953, she moved to Tangier, Morocco to help establish the first Baha'i community in that country 
and to assist in the spread of the Baha'i faith throughout northern and western Africa. In 1960, Dr. Austin joined the U.S. Foreign Service and served 10 years in Africa as a cultural attaché with the U.S. Information Agency. She initiated the first USIA women's programs on that continent, working with leaders and organizations in 13 African countries. As a result of those efforts, the USIA nominated Dr. Austin for the Federal Women's Award, and the University of Cincinnati gave her an honorary doctorate of humanities degree in 1969. In 2000, the university named a scholarship in her honor. Her outstanding story of service, spirit, and faith will undoubtedly inspire future generations to excel, succeed, and serve for years to come. The essential for peace is unity of conscience. Why? Because unity of conscience makes us willing to be just, to give the other fellow his due. And I hope we will continue to work with all the inward and outward obstacles in developing that unity of conscience in ourselves and in all we can touch. The time for transformation is now. I think there is a Baha'i prayer that can offer us guidance, strength, and determination. It is prayer which talks about protest, it talks about faith, and it talks about progress. And it goes, quote, O oh God, aid thy servants to raise up the word, to refute what is vain and false, to establish the truth, to spread the sacred verses abroad, and to make the morning's light to dawn in the hearts of the righteous. And I don't know what we're waiting for, but we should be galvanized into action because now is the time as the saying goes if not now when <laughs>